All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah. Yeah, I know some of you are just getting back from vacation, some are about to go, and you're here in church, so that's awesome. Yeah, so thanks for being here. Um, as he said, I'm Taylor Knock. I'm one of the lay elders here at Mercy, uh, which means essentially I uh, don't work for the church. I work for the Billy Graham Association. I also am a reserve chaplain in the uh, Air Force Reserves. Um, but I, and on top of that, I also serve to help shepherd and lead this church, along with Derek and Spence and all of them, and I'm very thankful that, for the opportunity to do that. Um, and as we get started, we'll be in Philippians 1, 3 to 7, um, and we'll be uh, going through that and a little bit more about myself, aside from the fact that I've been uh, married to my uh, beautiful, wonderful wife, Ashley, for 19 years, and we have four kids between the ages of 11 and 8 months. Um, so if you ever see us and wonder, uh, are they tired? Yes, Mercy Church, we're always tired. That's our life right now, but we're okay with it. Um, we love our kids. Um, and a little more about, about me, which might cause some of you to judge me, but that's okay, it's uh, relevant to our text, is when some of you grew up uh, watching sports, playing sports, and that's cool, I'm glad you guys did that. Um, that wasn't me. Um, I grew up uh, reading comics a lot, specifically Marvel comics, X-Men, Spider-Man. Um, I mean, Batman was cool and all, but that's what really spoke to my soul. Um, and this was before the days of the movies, um, before the culture kind of sh uh, shifted around this, when it was a very uncool thing to do. You didn't really let anybody know you did it, you kept it to yourself, you hid the comics in the closet, and you just kind of kept it quiet. Um, and that, as a matter of fact, I actually met my wife uh, when I was 14, um, and she was 15. She was a sophomore, I was a freshman, um, and so she was already cooler than me. Um, and as things started to get serious, whatever that means at the age we were, um, I realized I was going to have to reveal this very uncool secret to her. Um, and I did reveal it to her. She didn't run away laughing and still hasn't, so very thankful for that. Yeah. Now, the X-Men specifically, for those who are unaware, um, it's a group of superheroes who are born with strange and unusual powers that, that makes them mutants. Um, they're usually hated and feared by humanity, but they uh, follow a man named Charles Xavier with a dream of peaceful co coexistence between humans and mutants. Um, so this brought together mutants like Cyclops, who shot optic bl blasts from his eyes, was a straight-laced Boy Scout, and Wolverine, a rugged, abused, angry man who would fight on the same team um, for this dream. Um, and so they would often get killed, they would get persecuted, they would get hurt for this dream. People, people would die, but they would keep fighting for it, believing that that peace could come, and the dream was worth giving their lives to. Now, that was inspiring to me as I was growing up, as, as uh, the popularity of Marvel Now shows is inspiring to a lot of people. Um, but it's a fictional dream. It was just fiction. But we in the church have a better, true dream that's supposed to bring us together and unite us together for one cause. That's the goal that Christ gave us after his resurrection. Matthew 28, go to all the nations, share the good news, of the, the good news with all the nations, um, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what's supposed to unite us together, which we give our lives to. And this is the vision, the dream that Paul was serving when he wrote to the Philippians, um, in Philippians 1, 3 to 7. So just with that background, let's go ahead and read the scripture. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. These verses can be tremendously helpful to us as we wonder how to be a partner in the gospel. Paul was a former Pharisee, and he was partnering with a church full of Gentiles in a Macedonian city for the advancement of the gospel. And these verses show what an effective partnership that was. And the truth we're going to see played out in these few verses is this. True gospel partners share in joy, share in suffering, and share in faith. Now to really see this gospel partnership in action between Paul and the Philippians, we need to look back to when the partnership started. It began when Paul first traveled to Philippi, back in Acts 16. In Philippi, an immigrant who feared God named Lydia, a demon-possessed slave girl, and a, and a Roman jailer were the first converts to Christianity, which showed just how diverse this early church was. There was absolutely nothing similar about the background or lives of these individuals. 
but they were all united under the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was in prison, beaten, and arrested in the short time he spent at Philippi. He was run out of town, and he suffered greatly to plant this church. And now, these verses show us the church in Philippi is suffering in the same way. Even in the midst of this, as they're being imprisoned, as they are being persecuted, however, they sent a financial gift to Paul. They sent one of their own people to minister to him during his time in prison. And they continue to partner with him in the gospel. They are poor and needy, and yet they stay united with Paul in the mission. Oftentimes, as we've seen before, Paul wrote to churches who were really messing things up. And he had to rein them in saying, guys, this isn't how it's supposed to be. But that was not the case with Philippi. They were a church that was staying focused on the mission. And they were partnering with Paul in that mission. And they set quite an example for us. So with that background, let's go through the different ways this passage shows us how we partner in the gospel. First, gospel partners share in joy. Sharing in joy is exactly what Paul says he does when he thinks of Philippians in verses 3 to 4. He thanks God in all of his remembrance of them, and he always does this with joy. Now, true biblical joy is something with deeper roots than we often think of. It isn't just being happy. It isn't that feeling we get after a really good day. That's fleeting and can be taken away in an instant. No, true joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It is a deep, sustaining contentment that enables us to walk joyfully in all circumstances because the Holy Spirit is always with us, pointing us upward to the hope of Christ, reminding us that life is about a lot more than our present circumstances. Paul and the Philippians could have this joy in the midst of prison and persecution because their shared faith in the gospel was far more powerful than their need for pleasant circumstances. Verse 5 tells us directly that the Philippians added to Paul's joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. That first day he's pointing them back to is when he first came to Philippi, sharing the good news and planning the church. Since that day, the Philippians have supported the mission of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth with Paul, and he has joyfully thanked God for them. And here I have to ask myself, when I pray for my church or other believers, do I begin by thanking God for them? Thanking God for the people, even by name? There may be needs or struggles, as Paul notes there are in this letter, but it is good, good to first thank God for the church he's made us a part of, because we were not entitled to salvation. We were no more deserving than anybody else. Yet Christ came for us, and he saved us. This should bring us joy, and it should enable us to pray for others in the church with joy. It can be easy for us to come into the church looking to be fed, looking to be taken care of, and never really being part of the community, never really partnering. But no real joy is found in that. When we don't take a step to partner, we rob both the church and ourselves of the sort of joy Paul is talking about here. I'm not saying it's easy. I say this as someone who has been deeply wounded by multiple churches throughout my life. That happens, and I know it's happened to some of you. I know it's happened in some truly terrible ways, and for that I'm sorry. I'm really grateful that all of you are here who've been there trying to heal from those wounds. Because whenever we just focus on that pain, on those wounds, and ignore the joy the Bible tells us can be found in the church, we miss a great reward. In Letters to a Young Pastor, which I recommend to anyone aspiring to be in ministry, Eric E. Peterson, the son of the late pastor Eugene Peterson, shares a letter his father wrote concerning a man who was thinking of leaving his Presbyterian church for the local Catholic church down the road. Reflecting on this man's reasons, which are like many of the reasons we often leave churches today or change churches, Eugene Peterson wrote, Church is church under whatever name, a dunghill. And Presbyterian dung and Catholic dung are about as different as cow dung and horse dung. But there's treasure in that dunghill, as you and I both know. But there are so many who never find the gems. Do they give up too soon? Or are they looking for the wrong thing? In Philippians, Paul is showing us how to not focus on the dunk hill, which is never hard to find. The dunk hill is here, Mercy Church. If you stick, a stick around long enough, you'll smell it. But Paul is telling us how to find the gems, the joy in the dunk hill. In their joy, Paul and the Philippians partnered together so that others could hear and believe the gospel. And this joy, this sort of partnership is available to us today. 
Today, we have believers just like Paul with a heart for the nations and who could use financial gifts just like Paul received. Many of them have to raise their own financial support and it is not easy. It's never easy. And many of us are capable of sending them. And we should. Paul reminds us in Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? If you know someone who's gone or is preparing to go, I'd encourage you just reach out to them. Let them share their heart with you and consider giving. That's partnership. Be one who brings them joy on the tough days because they will have them. Look to the mission Christ has called us to and partner with them joyfully. There might even be someone here and you feel that pull in your heart, God calling you to the nations. And what I'd ask you to do is just tell someone to share your heart with them. Let them partner you with you joyfully in that way by being the one who encourages you as you're thinking about those things and going forward in those things. Let them share in that joy and let's share in joy together. The next thing this passage tells us is that gospel partners share in suffering. We see this highlighted in verse seven where Paul discusses two ways that Philippians are suffering along with him. He reminds the Philippians that you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This verse means it is likely that Philippians themselves are being imprisoned and persecuted for their faith. So Paul and the Philippians are sharing about joy and suffering for the gospel together. And remarkably, Paul is telling them that God has actually blessed this present moment of suffering, which is something that, if we're honest, we don't like to hear. How hard can it be to believe that our own suffering is a gift? It's a gift we want to return, right? These aren't, there aren't best-selling books about the seven ways to receive the suffering that will bless you. We, as Americans, typically hate all suffering. We run from it. Even Christians think that anytime we suffer, it must be a sign that we did something wrong, God doesn't love us, or God isn't real. This value creeps into our walk with Christ, and we must reject that. Verse after verse reminds us not only that suffering can be expected for the Christian, but that believers can actually be blessed to suffer. Jesus himself in Matthew 5 verses 10 to 12 tells us, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. Then later, just before he went to suffer and die on the cross for us, Jesus said this in John 16, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. That's right. Jesus promises eternal life to those who place their faith in him. He promises joy and hope. He promises many good things. And he also promises suffering and specifically suffering for our faith in him. It's not something we face in the way many have, but there are many around the world who suffer and die for their faith in Jesus Christ today. And those who face this suffering, who face it and endure joyfully, knowing that a rich reward awaits them for eternity, are those the Bible calls blessed. Suffering, it's part of Jesus' plan. We have to see it as part of partnering in the gospel. This doesn't mean we have to seek it out, but we can't buy the lie that we must avoid at all costs either. When we run from it, we're also running from the true joy Jesus is leading us into. Because of our American belief that good people don't suffer, we struggle with sins, with chronic pain, with hurts that will never let up or that we think never will, and we come into church smiling because we think that's what we have to do. We have to cover it up. We can't let anyone know just how badly we are hurting. We suffer in silence when we should be sharing in suffering. Paul and the Philippians opening up and supporting one another in the midst of great suffering should convict us all because we as a church are missing the joy they show is available to us if we refuse to share in suffering. As K.J. Ramsey in her book, This Too Shall Last, a Christian author who has walked through chronic pain for years once wrote, when the burdens of our hearts are many, when the despair of the present moment makes us wonder if we can keep trying or keep living, The community of faith can bring light into our darkness. And I need to step out of my notes here for a moment because I've lived this. 
I've walked this. So my little firecrack of a daughter, Kaya, is turning three in ex- exactly two months from now. And, part, and we're very thankful for her, very blessed to have her in our lives. But part of her story will always be the story of miscarriage. Because right before my wife got pregnant with her, we were pregnant with who we thought was going to be our third living child. We actually got pregnant with Kaya before the due date of that child came around. But we lost that child very early on. And if you've been there, you know it, it hurts in ways that you don't expect it to, you don't imagine it could. And by the way, a little aside, if uh, you've known someone who's been there and you said to them, not a big deal, you know, you can have other kids, stuff like that, your application for today might be to just go to that person and repent for doing that, because it is a big deal. When you lose the child that early, you don't know anything. You lose everything. You don't know the gender. We didn't know if our child would be a boy or a girl. We didn't know how they would smile. We didn't know who they would be. We didn't know anything. And we didn't know why we lost them. And it hurt. That was a painful loss. And when we were hurting, when we were suffering, part of what helped us through was mercy, sharing in our suffering, even though only a handful of you actually knew what we were going through. Because we lost that baby on the weekend, right before church. And we came anyways, even though we really didn't feel like it. And we came and we tried to sing worship songs along with you, along with you guys. But we couldn't. We tried and we wept. But there was something healing and beautiful about the fact that when we couldn't sing praises to God while we were sitting in that prison of grief that we could only see a little bit of light through, that people to our right and our left were singing those praises beside us. Because that's, because when we come in here, those songs that we sing, they're not just about if we like the songs, if they make us feel good, um, or if we feel like singing. They are about first Jesus Christ and praises to him, and it's a way to minister to, to partner with someone in suffering who's around you. You might not even know that suffering's happening. And in that day, it ministered greatly to us as it can minister to anybody. And that's part of how we share in suffering. And finally, this passage shows us that gospel partners share in faith. We can see this in what is the key verse that holds this passage together. Verse six, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This verse is a beautiful reminder that it was not the Philippians' own doing that saved them. Christ began a good work in them that enabled them to do these good works and to be those faithful partners. This was an encouragement to them as they certainly wondered if they can endure in the face of persecution. Paul is reminding them that their faithfulness did not begin with them and does not ultimately depend on them. Christ began the good work in them, and they can have faith that he will bring it to completion. Remember who it is who wrote these words. When we first meet Paul in the Bible, he's not some pastor. He's persecuting the church. The book of Acts tells us he actually breathed out threats and murder against the church. But even then, at those first moments when Paul was desperately trying to destroy the church, Jesus was there working on him. When Paul himself discussed Jesus appearing to him on the road to Damascus to save him in a blinding light, he recounted Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against against the goads. This unusual phrase, kicking against the goads, explains a lot about why Paul was so violent, for Jesus was already working on him before the Damascus Road experience. He was already revealing the truth to him, and Paul was working as hard as he could to deny it. He was without peace until he finally submitted to the truth. Then he had peace that enabled him to write a letter to encourage others even when chained to guards in prison. He had peace because Christ was with him in that moment and he knew he would be with him for all eternity. Some of you might be uncomfortable here because you're kicking against the goads just like Paul was and you have no peace. You're staying in that toxic relationship that the Holy Spirit has told you you should end. You are staying in that job where you have to cut corners because you think, you think you need it more than Jesus. You're still staying up late, going to those websites you know you shouldn't be going to, trying to find satisfaction there where you know you can only find it in Him. And the only way you can find peace is through surrender. So I want to urge you to do that. Just surrender to Christ. Because the truth is that you can spend your entire life going from empty well to empty well, trying to find that peace, trying to run from suffering. But suffering and death will eventually find you, as it finds us all. 
and denying that will not give you peace. It's only through placing your faith in the one who's fully defeated death and will one day return to make all things new that you will find peace. With faith in Jesus, you can face all suffering, even if it takes you from this life, with a joy and a peace that surprises all understanding because you know that death has no victory. Jesus does. And through faith in him, his victory can become your victory. These words that Paul wrote, reminding himself in the Philippians that Jesus will finish the work he began in them, can give great peace to any of us who may be struggling. What we must remember in those moments is what Paul reminds the Philippians of here. Our victory is not ultimately dependent on our own strength. Our salvation was never, never dependent on our goodness. Look at Lydia, the slave girl, and the jailer. All different, none worthy of the death of Christ. And all receive salvation because of the work Jesus Christ began in them. We never receive salvation because we are somehow good or because we find the inner strength to be good on our own when we accept Christ. Jesus has saved us and it's continuing to save us. Have faith in that. The idea that Christ is bringing our salvation to completion implies that the work in us is not yet complete. And that's good news for us in those days that we doubt, stumble, and hurt. Our failures do not mean we aren't saved. They are instead reminders that the work is still being done. We are still being sanctified. And when Christ once again pulls us out of those pits we fall into time and time again and gives us hope we forgot we could ever find again, we're being reminded that this good work will one day be completed. Sin has been defeated. Death has no victory. And we will one day learn to live like it until we are face to face with Jesus in glory. On that day... We will walk in the completed work. On the day we are face to face with Jesus, we will not look at our troubles and wonder why we walk in them, but we will look at our Savior who still loved us, still died for us, and still worked in us despite them. We won't see our glorified selves and wow, look, look at this amazing thing I've done. Look who I made myself. That's ridiculous. What we will instead do is look to Him and thank Him knowing that he has made us pure and clean in a way we absolutely never could have, could have been without him. We work at our salvation in fear and trembling. That's true. But he truly does the work. He sets us free. He gives us eternal life. When we thank him for the freedom we never could have received apart from him. True gospel partners share in joy, share in suffering, and share in faith. We can partner together in the gospel when we look to Jesus recognizing that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And he's been there from the first day until now. For when Paul speaks about Christ being there from beginning to end, he's looking, back, looking much farther back than the founding of the church at Philippi. He's taking us back to the very first verse of the Bible, when Genesis 1-1 tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Our triune God was there on that first day of creation. He was there before then. On the very first day of humanity, when he himself created Adam and Eve in his own image, he was there. And he's here with humanity now. In Genesis 3, when the very first sin was committed and our ancestors first tried to cover their sin unsuccessfully, God was there to cover their nakedness with the lamb he himself killed to make them close. He was there as humanity became more and more depraved and was there watching Noah, he was there delivering him from the floodwaters through the ark and was there with the promise that he would never again destroy all living creatures because of the sin of man. He was there with Abraham. From the very first day, he called him out to form a people who would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. He was there when he gave Abraham and Sarah Isaac, the son of promise. He was there to give Abraham a round of sacrifice in the place of his son, making it clear that he does not expect us to sacrifice our children to him, for he is the God who would instead sacrifice his own son for us. God was there through slavery in Egypt, through coming to the promised land, and through the time the land was burned and his people were exiled. He was there when his prophets continued to promise his people that a new covenant was coming, when they would be given new hearts. He was there when he fulfilled that promise he'd made through the generations and sent his own son to his people. He was there on that joyful first day when he told Mary she would become pregnant. And he was there on that dark day when his son took his final breath on the cross paying the penalty for all our sins so that we who have been dead in our sins since our first day could be raised to new life forevermore. 
And he was there when death was defeated and Jesus returned from the grave. He was there when Jesus sent out his disciples to every tribe, nation, tongue, and people group, telling them not to fear, for he would be with them always, even to the end of the age. He was there as the gospel was spread from Israel to Asia, to Africa, to Europe, to here, and around the world. He was there from the first time the good news that Jesus Christ had come was shared. And through the Holy Spirit, whom he sent to indwell all those who place their faith in him, he is here now. He was with Paul in that prison cell. He was with the Philippians in the face of persecution. And he's with us today. He has always known us and has always seen us. He is there through every joyful season and is with us in our suffering. He has given eternal life to all those who repent of their sins and place their faith in him and has promised that he will always be with us. He will be there at the end of this age and, will be there, and we will be there with him when he makes all things new. When he wipes away every tear from our eye and we live free with him for all eternity. He was always there from the first day. He is here now and we can trust him to always be there. If you've denied it, if you've kicked against the goads as Paul once did, I urge you to trust in Jesus. Trust in the one who's always been there, offering you peace only he can bring. It doesn't mean everything will be perfect and easy. Paul faced problems. So do the Philippians. So do we here at Mercy Church. As long as we walk in this fallen world, we will walk in suffering, but we've been given a church that can walk through that suffering with us, that can share in our joy with us, I can share in propping up our faith and encouraging us with us. Jesus gives us joy that's impossible without him. He gives us blessings in the midst of suffering. We can trust in him and how sweet it is to do so. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you are the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. You created all things and you hold all things together. And yet amazingly, you do not see us as too small to concern yourself with. You love us and sent your own perfect son through whom you created all things to die so we could live. May we look to that truth with joy in all circumstances. May we point our brothers and sisters in Christ to you on days that are hard. May we share the joy of the gospel with those who remain far from you. May we trust that you are always with us and may your love bring us great joy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.